chapter 4, picking up today in verse 10. As we consider together the blessing of giving and receiving. Philippians chapter 4, in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. And not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Shall we pray? Father, we do thank you today for your word and the promises that are found within it. Lord, help us to recognize these blessings, Lord, that are ours in Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. At this point in the life of the Apostle Paul, he had lost his freedom. He had been arrested. He was in prison, chained to a Roman guard, awaiting his court date before Caesar. That would eventually lead to his martyrdom. Yet as dark as things appeared, the Lord was using it for good within his life. Paul had the opportunity to write several letters to the churches, one of which we're studying now, the book of Philippians. And in the midst of all of his challenges, Paul discovered that the joy of the Lord was his strength. And one of the secrets to Paul's joy was encouragement from others. There is not a person in this room today that does not need encouragement now and again. And the Bible actually has much to say on this subject. And Paul felt extremely encouraged. In fact, he even says here that he greatly rejoiced through the support of the congregation in their financial partnership. Again, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. It had been 10 years since Paul had planted the church in Philippi. And once the church was planted and established, Paul continued on his church planting mission, planting other churches. And the congregation in Philippi actually continued to support Paul in those endeavors. But as time passed, it wasn't always easy to reach Paul. He was constantly on the move. The Philippians wanted to support him, but they couldn't always locate him. They, therefore, they lacked opportunity. But now that Paul was in prison, it would seem that the Philippians picked up where they left off and supported Paul once again. And it would appear that their gift couldn't have come at a better time. Paul knew that the church was concerned about him, that they cared for him. And their financial support was actually a tangible sign to him of their sacrificial love. However, Paul was very sensitive to the subject of giving. And he never wanted the churches that he ministered at to think that he might be looking for more donations from them. And therefore, he makes it very clear in the next verse what his intentions were. If you look at verse 11, he says, not that I speak in regard to need, because I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul was grateful for the generosity of the church in Philippi, but he didn't want them to feel obligated or pressured to support him. It is a challenge for many ministers within the church to talk about, to preach on the subject of giving financially to the work of the ministry. And I think there are several reasons for this. One, you never want to appear greedy Two, you don't want to be 
linked to or seen as a prosperity teacher that preached prosperity doctrine, some churches actually have walls that actually are, have pictures of the previous year's top givers. <laughs> some churches require members to provide the church with a copy of their tax returns for membership in order to verify that they give 10% to the church. Some preachers even emphasize tithing as a legalistic requirement for salvation. And there are some who are quick to pronounce any financial difficulty that you may be having at this moment as a direct result of your lack of giving, which is sad. And therefore, it is a challenge. But when you come to it in Scripture, you've been here long enough, you teach what the Bible says on the subject. Giving to the work of the Lord should never be out of constraint or manipulated. It should be motivated by a love for Jesus and obedience to his word. The amazing thing about Paul's ministry is, as I said, he never wanted to be a burden to anyone. In fact, he made it a practice when he was planting the churches to minister in a way that he was bivocational. He would make tents for a living to support himself and those who worked alongside of him. And then in addition to that, he would just plant the churches free of charge. And he tells us why this, because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, listen to what Paul said. It gives you an insight into his heart for ministry. He said, you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil, laboring night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Uh, later on in his second letter to the same church, in the third chapter this time, he said, we didn't eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. In other words, what Paul was saying to the churches that he planted, the reason we did what we did and in the way that we did it was not because we wanted you to, th we didn't want you to think that we wanted to take something from you. We wanted you to understand that we were here to impart something to you. We were here to give, not to take. And I love the example of the apostle Paul. You know, I was raised in a church where, uh, our pastor often said, and to the point where it is embedded into my mind and has become a pillar in the philosophy of ministry for me, that where God guides, God provides. And my pastor would always say that. And he had so many stories that he would tell us of God's provision. And I used to be amazed at those stories and not just amazed, but also inspired and we ended up having now our own stories of God's faithfulness and his provision. And I, I think this has been a practice for us within the ministry. Paul was grateful for the gift, but he also wanted the Philippians to know that he had learned a valuable lesson in the area of contentment. That's why in verse 13, notice Paul said this, I have, notice this word, underscore it, learned. I've learned to be content in whatever state I am in. Being content was not something that came naturally. I don't think it comes naturally to most people, but it is something that is learned. In fact, the language implies here, I have come to learn. I didn't always think this way, but in light of what God has allowed me to go through, in light of what the Lord has put me through, the things that I've experienced, Paul could say, I've, I've actually learned some things and I've learned how to be provided for. I've learned to survive with no provision. I, I've learned to be abased. I know how to be abound, how to abound. When Paul said, I've learned to be abased, it's actually a word that implies being very low. And there were plenty of times in life and ministry when Paul was at the, the rock bottom, brought very low through hardship and difficulty. And even in the midst of that, he said, through that process, I've learned something and that's to be content in the Lord. 
Paul had learned what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Furthermore, when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, he said, godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. The writer of Hebrews said in chapter 13 in verse five, he said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Are you content where the Lord has you today? Interesting, Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am in. I wonder if you're content in this state that you're in. Certain things. But Paul tells us, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. I I have been in some of the the lowest spots in my life. And in the midst of that, I have, Paul could say, I have found the Lord to be there. If you've ever read through the life of the apostle Paul, he, in his epistle to the Corinthians, his second epistle, he's probably the most transparent as he gives details into the school of contentment, the lessons that he learned, the tests that he went through. Let me read them to you if you're unfamiliar. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, in verse 23, that he was in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. It's like when Paul showed up in a town, probably the first question he would ask is, what's the prison system like here? I'm just curious, what, <laughs> what's it like? Do they use rods or whips here? When they, I mean, this is, this is something that he faced. But he goes on and he says in verse 24, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. Imagine just floating out in the ocean for a night and a day. But that's not all. Paul said, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, pretty much all perils. (laughs) In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger, in thirst, in fasting, often in cold and nakedness. Verse 28, besides the other things, <laughs> like, like there's more than that. Besides the other things, that which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for the churches. I mean, yeah, this is what I've experienced physically and it's painful, but let me just tell you, there's something else that's, that I deal with every single day and that's my concern for the churches that have been planted. Paul's contentment was not based upon his present circumstance or conditions, but rather the presence of Christ. And that is why in verse 13, he could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then please understand the context in which he writes this. Some people like to extract Philippians 4.13 from the context And it is a powerful passage and one that we should cling to. But God wants me to fulfill all my dreams. I can do all things through Christ. It's like, yeah, look at Paul's suffering. I can can go through the pain and the hardship through the strength that God provides for me. That's what he's saying in the context. I can do all of these things. What things? The things he just listed through the power of Christ, not his own strength, but the strength of the Lord. You know, there was such a low point in Paul's life and ministry. Again, 2 Corinthians records it, where Paul was given something called a thorn in the flesh. He said it was a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him, to keep him humble. Because of all the revelations that he'd received, God allowed something to come into Paul's life to be used to keep him humble. In fact, Paul prayed 
that the Lord would take it away. Three times he said, God, would you please take this away from me? Lord, would you please heal me of this? Whatever it was, the thorn in the flesh, and there are some speculations as to what it was, some physical difficulty that he had. But this was the Lord's response to Paul in 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, verse 9. In response to his prayer, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This was God's response to Paul's prayer. Lord, please take this away. The Lord said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you grace to endure. I'm gonna give you strength when you're weak. And that is why Paul would go on to say, therefore, most gladly, I'll boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's when Paul was at his weakest moment, when he felt like he couldn't go any further, it was then that God's strength upheld him and God's grace was sufficient to sustain him. Maybe you're in such a place today. It's possible. Where your strength has run out, but God's strength never runs out. You feel the sense of weakness and inability and yet God's grace is tangible, sustaining, upholding us. It's interesting, when the nation of Israel was going through the wilderness, there was a record that talks about that the Lord bore them up on eagles' wings. Meaning when they couldn't go Further, the Lord carried them. And maybe that's where you are today. And God's grace is sufficient for you. And it's sufficient for me. Paul returns in verse 14 and he says, nevertheless, hey, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not trying to pressure you to give to me. I'm just, I'm letting you know, nevertheless, let me just say to you, you've done well that you've shared in my distress. In other words, he was, there's a sense of gratitude. Thank you for, for doing that. I really, I, I, it came at, at, a, at an important time. Have you ever been in, in a place where somebody, somebody just seemed to be right on time with encouragement that you needed and they didn't necessarily know that that's what you needed when you needed it and they just came through and just, what, what did that do for you? It just, man, it lifted you up. It, it helped you. Be that person for somebody else. Paul said, you've done well to share in my distress. Verse 15, now you Philippians, you know that in the beginning of the gospel, that is his ministry, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once again and again for my necessities. More than once. When Paul left Philippi, they continued to, to help him. And he said, in fact, you were the only church that supported me. You know, when I was 25 and we planted our first church, I mean, just 25, uh, with my wife and two sons, you know, church planning is different now, I think, than when it was back in the day. Um, like many things have changed. Um, when we went, there was no internet. There was no, uh, cell phones really weren't a big thing yet. Um, they had phone books and uh, things like that. And they had actual phones, young people, in the house. That you like, <laughs> that was really old, right? And then you had the beep, beep, beep. You know, but this was like, and then, then remember when we got the, the cordless? They were like, what? <laughs> Anyways, no, go ahead. I can hear you. Wait, let me pull the antenna out. Okay. You know, it's like, you remember those? But, but where was I going? I, I digress. <laughs> I come back. Oh, yeah, I remember. When, when church planning is much different than it was when we started out. You know, now it's like we have a team. We have a support. We got a church that pays for blah, blah, blah. Like, our, my pastor was like, take care. <laughs> we'll be praying for you. If God's in it, we'll find out. You know, like, that, that's like how we went out. <laughs> like, bye. And... When we went out, the church that, I, that sent us out said, we will support you for three months and then you're on your own. Which basically means you got three months to get a job and get this thing started or 
you're not coming back. I mean, that, that's it. That was it. And so we went out and it was that kind of mentality. And, and, and you just, you, you did whatever you had to do. There wasn't any churches that were supporting us. But there, it's interesting, during that season, there were individual people that we didn't, we didn't send out a newsletter, you know, with, with, with pictures of us. And we just, we, we just didn't have that. But we had people that knew we were going out. And unbeknownst to us, they supported us. And we never knew where it was going to come from. And we, or if it would even show up. And I mean, there were moments when we had just, just exactly what we needed. And because of those people, that church was planted. And, and with, without that, we wouldn't have survived. And, and we, we did everything we could. Paul said, you did well to handle my distress. You were, you were the only ones that supported me. And even when he should have been supported by others, he wasn't. In fact, when Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he actually used the church in Philippi as a model, a template for how they should give. An example, really, for believers. One thing you might find unique if you are new to Calvary Chapel is that we do not uh, get up here on this platform and beg for money. And uh, that just doesn't happen. We, we have never done that. We will never do that. There are times, however, when we may make you aware of a need or something that it, the Lord is doing and give you opportunity to partner with and be a part of it. Um, but that's really about it. We, we like to share about how the Lord is using the generosity of us collectively as a fellowship to minister far outside of this community, into other parts of the country, even into other parts of the world. The Lord is doing marvelous works through this fellowship. But we never use or will use methods that are carnal or manipulative. We don't have thermometers. We don't have uh, <laughs> swag bags for those givers or whatever. I don't know. Whatever, whatever they're doing these days. Um, you'll never have somebody call you and ask you, hey, where's, where's the money? You'll never have somebody interview you and ask for your W-2. That won't happen. Um, to let you know whether you can be a part of this church or not. We believe that if you've been here long enough, you see that God does provide and that he provides through his people. And I could tell you countless stories of how God has faithfully provided for the church. When it comes to giving, hear me on this. Everything that we have is a gift from God. It, it actually all belongs to him. I think that's something that we sometimes take for granted. We don't realize, hey, it's all his. It's all his. Secondly, that when it comes to giving, it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship. That's what it is. It's offering back to God that which I have been given. If it's, I don't give to God so that he'll bless my life. The Lord has blessed my life and it is a privilege to give back to him. And I'm in awe of that. In fact, Paul would say here in verse 17, please look with me. He said, not that I seek the gift. Don't misunderstand. I'm not seeking the gift here, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul said, we don't seek the gift, we seek the fruit that's coming to you. Anything that is given to the Lord, anything that we give to the Lord, you give to the Lord, I give to the Lord, there's not gonna be a plaque that says, check it out, look what, look what he gave, because that'd be the only reward you get. We're not gonna parade you up here and say, listen, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up. Best giver, right here, let's go. Come on, everybody. In fact, let's stand and let's, you know, no, no one's gonna do that. Rather, we receive our rewards when we get to heaven. And listen, when, you, when we give faithfully unto the Lord, you're not going to get to heaven one day and be walking around there thinking, you know what? If I wouldn't have given to that church, I could have got that new barbecue from Home Depot. It would have been <laughs> the one with the smoker. I mean, I just think, what a waste. No, you're not even going to be thinking about that. It's not going to be a thought in your mind. We can't take it with us, folks, but we can send it ahead. If, if we are being blessed spiritually, then we... Support the ministry. If, if you are not being fed, listen to me, if you're not being fed spiritually, if you are not being taken care of spiritually and you, you don't feel good about giving, then, then don't. <laughs> but 
Find somewhere where you can and support some work in some ministry. Why? Because it's fruit to your account. It's, there's, there's something attached to it. No, no one is coercing or whatever. You, you want to do it as unto the Lord. That, that is the goal. It's an act of worship. Paul uses the church in Philippi as an example, a great model. In fact, for a moment, I want you to see this. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, would you? Just a few pages back to the left. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And let me draw your attention to the first verse. The best commentary on the Bible, by the way, is the Bible, if you didn't know that. And here we find 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Look at Paul as he cites these folks as an example. He said, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches in Macedonia. That would be Philippi. That in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and even beyond their ability, they were freely willing and implored us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Paul draws the attention of the Corinthians in the north to the example of their brothers in the south, the churches of Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, and what they were doing. And to observe their example of how they gave generously. And there's a few things that he points out concerning these churches that I think are a good model for us. First of all, they gave in the midst of difficulty. That is what Paul said, in great trial of affliction. In other words, they were going through it. They were experiencing hardship themselves, but they didn't let that stop them from being a blessing to others. He points this out, even in the midst of their trials, in their own poverty, he said. It was a tremendous testimony as they gave what they could. I don't know if you've observed this or not, but I have seen over the years that some of the most generous people that I have ever met are not those who are flourishing monetarily. They just are generous and give. Many times it's those who don't have a lot give the most. I don't know why that is, but it is something that I have observed. When Jesus was with his disciples one day in the temple area, they were observing the gifts that people were bringing. And there were those that would bring a band and send it before them. And you just hear the wheelbarrow of cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And everybody would just be, wow, look at that. And they, they, they had an entourage of people as they brought in their gifts. But Jesus was not just observing how much people were giving, but rather the way in which they were giving. And there was one person there that Jesus noted. In fact, in Mark chapter 12, verse 43, here's what Jesus says to his disciples concerning one widow woman. He said in verse 43, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all those who have given to the treasury for they put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Most people were looking at the amount. Jesus was looking at the heart, the way in which it was given. And here this poor widow woman gave what she could and Jesus commended her and said she put in more than everybody else even though she hadn't but in from the heavens perspective she had and she would not lose her reward for doing so from time to time people will ask me the question on this subject I've been asked on radio programs I've been asked personally um, in the congregation what do you think about tithing, John? What do you think about uh, 10%? Uh, as the Bible refers to, what is tithing anyway? Tithe comes from the Old Testament. It refers to a tenth. And in the Old Testament, under the law, the people would give a tithe to the Lord. What most people don't understand is because they don't maybe study the Old Testament thoroughly to understand that it wasn't just 10% under the law. And actually, if you do the math, it was 25%. You're like, whoa, yeah, I just give the tithe, 25%. I mean, this is what they did under the law. 
This was required for them. But when you come to the New Testament, there is no set amount. God doesn't give us a percentage. You'd be hard pressed to find it. It's not there, in other words. Um, so the question then becomes, well, what does a person give? If we give 10% under the law, what am I supposed to give under grace? I need to ask the Holy Spirit that question. 10% for someone who makes $10,000 a year is a lot. 10% for somebody who makes millions, it really isn't that much. So I have to ask the Lord, if, if, if that's what they gave under the law, what am I to give under grace? Here's a good rule of thumb for this. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Make a note of this passage. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. This is what it says. Let each man do or give according as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. The word actually is hilarious. A hilarious giver. Ask the Lord, what is God saying? What does God want you to do? For us and our family, and again, I don't want to get too much into it, but it just comes out automatically. I just, I just, I just, and I'm, and I'm not like, oh man, are you serious? We got to do that again. It's, 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 it's just, it's the Lord's. I'm, I, here's what I'm amazed, folks. I'm amazed at how much he lets me keep. I'll say that. Why does he, it's all his anyway. Like you let me keep that? That's crazy. And so I want to give as I purpose in my heart and I don't want to do it grudgingly. If, this might come as a shock to many of you today. I don't know that you'll hear this sermon anywhere, but if, if, you, if you can't give to the Lord cheerfully, you ready for this? You know what I'm going to say. Keep it. Keep it. You're like, Whew, so glad you said that. <laughs> I'm relieved. I love this church. Uh, you know, if you, the reason why I say that is if you can't give cheerfully, if you give grudgingly, it doesn't do you any good because God looks on the heart. Rather, uh, give cheerfully to the Lord because he's given you so much just in response. But not only did they give in the midst of difficulty, but I also want you to know they gave willingly. It says here, verse three, I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. The Apostle Paul points out to the church in Corinth that those in the South, in spite of difficulty, they gave willingly. It was of their own free will. Paul, Paul didn't need to force them to make a pledge, get them to sign a card, do this and that. No, he just, he gave them the opportunity. They, they just gave, not out of constraint, but they, they wanted to do it. Listen, we're not gonna today after, you know, just because we're talking about giving, we wanna have an application. Ushers, lock the doors. We are now going to, you know, you know what I'm saying? We're gonna, we're gonna give, I feel the Lord telling me right now that someone outside has, you know, I mean, this is just cheap carnival tricks. This is, this is, not, this is not how God wants his church to operate. That we shouldn't be doing that. We, we should just, this, if, you, if you're being blessed, then praise God. Give willingly. No one's going to twist your arm and, hey, did you, how much did you, I was noticing that. No, it's not going to happen. In fact, Mark Twain, I read about Mark Twain. You've heard the name. Mark Twain was so frustrated as he attended a service once where the preacher continued to make appeals for money that when the plate came by, he took a dollar out. <laughs> and that's why we don't pass the plate any longer. <laughs> you know, that's not why. But these people, they just gave willingly. They gave willingly because it was for the Lord. But also you'll notice Paul highlights that they gave insistently. He said, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Paul knew these churches were struggling, having difficulty. And so it seems that he was hesitant to say, listen, guys, it's okay. And they were saying, no, you, you take it. You better, Paul, you take this urging us. And Paul would not rob them of their blessing. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. And there is a blessing that is attached to giving. And I've learned that you can never outgive God. I hope you've learned that lesson as well. God is so faithful and they were giving and, and just insistently. And I'll say this, sometimes, I don't know if you've been on this end, but sometimes it's hard to be a gracious receiver 
Like with somebody, you're like, no, no, I'm good. No, no, mm, mm, mm. You know, you're actually, maybe you're saying, no, I'm a, a very gracious receiver. And if you know anybody, no, but, but this, <laughs> sometimes it's hard. It's easier sometimes to give to people than it is to, to receive. I, it is sometimes for me as well. Um, because you never want them to have a, have a misunderstanding or, or, or you think, okay, now I owe them. Now I've got to, you know, I've got to one-up them. You know, uh, that's not the case. They gave earnestly, insistently. And then most importantly, they gave spiritually because it says not only as we had hoped, but this is important. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. In other words, before assent was given to God, they gave their lives to the Lord. And, and folks, that's the first step. It's, it's giving your life to the Lord. Because God doesn't want your money. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants to spend eternity with you. And, he was, and God is so loving and so generous that he gave his only son so that we could be with him. That, that's what he wants. He wants your heart more, more than, than your financial resources. But, but I think you have to give yourself to the Lord. And my question this morning, even today, in the light of this context, is have you done that? Have you actually given your life to Christ? Have you committed your life to him? Because there's people that write checks, but they're not ready for heaven. And, and that is far more concerning is your salvation. Do you know that you're going to heaven? And that is something you cannot purchase, but was purchased for you by Jesus. Prayerfully, you can say, my life belongs to the Lord. I heard an interesting story that there was a man who was attending some services where there was an evangelist. He was preaching and this, this man had recently given his life to the Lord. And again, in that setting, they would go around as so often they would do with an uh, uh, offering plate. And as they came to this newborn Christian, brand new, um, he told the usher, lower the plate, lower it, lower it. In fact, put it on the ground. He put it on the ground and it said that the man got out of his pew and then he stepped inside of it and said, I want God to have all there is to have of me. <laughs> it was just kind of this picture. Whether it's a true story or not, I don't know, but it did move me. I, I felt like I read it somewhere. Again, another reason why we don't have plates. We don't want people stepping in and that's not why. <laughs> but you understand the illustration. I've, I've given myself to the Lord and that's really what God wants, guys. He says to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. It's holy, acceptable. It's reasonable. There's another misconception I think sometimes that people have, and that is because I serve in some capacity, I do not give. Hey, listen, I do some things around here and they don't pay me. So uh, that's my, that's my, hey, that's between you and Jesus. That's between you and the Lord. But I think sometimes there's a misconception there. You have an example, a model of how to give, the way in which God desires us to give. Taking us back now to Philippians chapter four, verse 18, as we continue here and wrap this up. In verse 18, Paul said, indeed, I have all and abound and I'm full and I receive from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. Notice what Paul calls what he received, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Again, for a third time, Paul is expressing his heart of gratitude to the people as Epaphroditus came from the church and gave to Paul the gift. And Paul said, listen, I am, I'm so, in essence, I'm so blessed. I'm filled, overflowing. The fact that you would give in that way, I, I, am, I am blessed. And I want you to know, Paul said, that what you gave from heaven's perspective, it was like a sweet-smelling aroma. What, what does that even mean? Again, this is an allusion to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when sacrifices were offered, they would be placed on the altar and they would be consumed on the altar and the fragrance from the altar would rise to heaven and the smell, as it were, were was pleasing to the Lord. The Lord loved that smell, in other words. And Paul said, the way in which you give, like, like a sacrifice, like an act of worship, it's, it's well-pleasing to God. God is pleased when we are generous and give to the work of the ministry. It's an act of worship. And I think it's important for us to remember that, to see it in that way. I just want it to be pleasing to the Lord. And then finally, 
Paul adds this promise. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Oh, I have that underlined. I have that highlighted. But again, I think it's also important to notice the context in which it is written. Paul is saying to these people that were blessing others and providing, Paul said, hey, God's going to continue to provide for you too. God's going to take care of you. God has a name in scripture that he revealed himself to Abraham. It was Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And how many of you today, just in your own heart, you know and you've experienced the faithful provision of God and you didn't necessarily know where it was going to come from, how it was going to come through, or even if it would. And he has been Jehovah Jireh for you and for me. He has been our faithful provider. This is a promise given. God will provide for you. And maybe you're in need today. Where do you look? You look to the Lord. You ask the Lord to provide. You know, I think about all those right now who are suffering around the country. And you've seen the footage, no doubt, and the, and the pictures and the reports. And it is it's devastating. It's apocalyptic in nature. It's, it's overwhelming. And we're trying to uh, even here rally groups that will partner with Samaritan's Purse and go and be on the ground. And, and, and anybody can do that, by the way. You can just sign up and go. And once you get there, they'll set you up. And finding ways that we can give financially to support the work. So, there's so much devastation. And having lived in that part of the country, I know that once a storm comes, it's not long before the next one comes. And so I just, uh, we need to be praying and, and being available. But let me give you these words of Jesus as we conclude. In Luke chapter six, verse 38, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What a blessing to, to be able to give to the Lord. And it's an act of worship. It's for his glory. It's motivated by love. It should never be coerced. It should never... Uh, feel manipulated or um, forced. It's, it's just a blessing to be able to, to do that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And church, it's, it's my prayer um, that the Lord would just, as he has always done, continue to provide for our needs. And he does, and he is faithful. And I am grateful that we collectively as a church are able to not only support the work that is here in ministering to the people in our community, but in other parts of the country and even the uttermost parts of the world, this church, because of the faithfulness and the generosity, is, is ministering to, to places all over the world. And it's amazing to think that. Um, and I'm so grateful that God allows us to do that. And I pray that we would continue to be faithful in that. Well, I hope that gives you some insight into what the Bible has to say about giving and receiving for the glory of God. 